Journey with St. Paul, brought to you by the Greek Orthodox Christian Society. In this special 10 podcast series, Journey with St. Paul, the Greek Orthodox Christian Society takes you on a journey with the Apostle who evangelized the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles over the course of three missionary journeys from Jerusalem to Antioch and to Rome. This is The Journey with St. Paul. Today we will talk about the beginnings of Paul's missionary journeys in Greece, in Philippi, Thessaloniki and Berea. Sailing from Troas, Paul, Silas, Timothy and Luke end up in Philippi, the first city in Greece which was the foremost city of that part of Macedonia. The city of Philippi was named after King Philip II of Macedon, father of Alexander the Great. The inhabitants were Greek, and the city was a prosperous Roman colony. The men were known to be strong and proud. The women were known to be independent, discussed politics, and took part in elections, which meant that they enjoyed more freedom and power than many other women of the time. There were few Jews and no synagogue, just a prayer place near a river. Luke knew where this prayer place was, and so he guided Paul to it, only to find just a few women there praying. Paul, however, proceeded to preach to them, and they responded immediately with gratitude and joy. One lady, Lydia, stood out in her response. Lydia was a non-Jewish believer in God, a wealthy widow who had taken over her husband's business, which was the elite business of trading in purple dye. Purple dye was greatly prized in antiquity because it was extremely difficult to make and very expensive, which meant that purple dyed textiles became status symbols. Lydia's heart was open to listening to the things which were spoken by Paul, and she and her entire household were baptised. She begged Paul to use her home as the base for his work. After Paul departed from Philippi, the church in Philippi proved to be one of the most active members in finding ways to assist Paul in his missionary work from afar, sending him supplies and funds. In his letters to the Philippians, Paul often mentions their generosity, and we can assume that a lot of this generosity was inspired by Lydia. In one of these letters, he writes, In the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, Not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. While in Philippi, Paul and Silas were beaten with rods, thrown into prison, and their legs fastened in the stocks. All because Paul healed a slave girl who was demon-possessed and a fortune teller. This girl followed Paul and his co-workers and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days, until Paul became so annoyed that he turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. The Spirit that was speaking through the slave girl appeared to speak the truth. These men are the servants of the Most High. These words were supportive and helpful to the apostles, but Paul rejects them. Why? For the apostle Paul, it was vital not to accept the words and the practices of the evil one in any shape or form. Later, Paul would say to the Corinthians that we should always be cautious because Satan himself can appear like an angel of light in order to mislead people down the wrong path. Camouflage is one of his best tactics. Half-truths, or truths with evil intent, are used all the time in a variety of ways, so we need to be careful and discerning. When her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities, who then commanded them to be beaten with rods, thrown into a dark dungeon with their feet in stocks. Weak and bleeding from the beating, uncomfortable and in pain from the stocks, lying flat on their backs, uncertain about what will happen the next day, 
perhaps awaiting their death. At midnight, Paul and Silas begin to sing psalms to God in amongst the many prisoners who were groaning or swearing, but who now stopped to listen to the apostles. Paul and Silas were peaceful and serene in the midst of suffering and pain. They did not succumb to the pain or to fear or even to the need for sleep, but they prayed and sung psalms. This is amazing, but it is something that we notice in all the saints and martyrs. They experience great joy in the midst of their sufferings. They express words and hymns of joy and thanksgiving and love for God. They show a spirit of courage and fortitude, genuine and sincere love for God and for all people in the midst of their pain and even while they are being tortured. Paul says in his epistle to the Philippians, For I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Their imprisonment became the opportunity for the jailer and all his household to be baptised, but it was also used by Paul to claim his rights as a Roman citizen and accuse the Roman magistrates of beating them and imprisoning them without a trial. The magistrates were afraid when they realised that they had beaten and imprisoned Roman citizens, and they apologised and pleaded with them to depart from the city. The church at Philippi became a beloved church for Paul, who refers to them in one of his letters as his joy and crown. Therefore, my beloved and longed-for brethren, my joy and crown, stand fast in the Lord. The only concern was that two of the women appeared to be in disagreement, and this was affecting the church in Philippi. I implore Euodia and I implore Sintichi, says the Apostle Paul, to be of the same mind in the Lord. He asks the others to help these women who laboured with me in the gospel. Maybe Paul's request can be applied to many of us today who co-work for the Lord and find ourselves arguing and disagreeing with each other as to how the work of the Lord should be carried out. I implore you, says the Apostle Paul to all of us, bear your stubbornness, your insistence on doing things your way, your wounded pride, and work towards being of the same mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Another weakness, if it could be called one, is that they had become despondent on account of Paul's imprisonment in Rome, and so he urges them to rejoice in the Lord always, and he repeats this, to emphasise the importance of rejoicing despite any troubles we may be facing. And again I say rejoice. He also reassures them when he says, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And also, if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. From Philippi, Paul and Silas, Timothy and Luke go to Thessalonica, which was the first of the great cities of the Roman Empire, free, self-governing, Greek, cosmopolitan and populated by people from all over the world. As was his custom, Paul began his ministry by preaching to the Jews in the synagogue. For three Sabbaths, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. One of these was Jason, who offered hospitality to Paul and Silas. The Jews, however, who were not persuaded, became envious, and gathered a mob and set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason, hoping to drag Paul and Silas out to the mob. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city who only let them go once they had paid bail. So, from Thessalonica, the new Christians sent Paul and his co-workers to Berea, where exactly the same thing happened. 
So eventually the brethren, for his safety, put Paul into a boat bound for Athens. The Christian church that Paul left behind in Thessalonica grew to become a steadfast church. No other church did Paul commend so highly on their endurance in the face of persecutions. We ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. The only problem with the church at Thessalonica, which became the reason to write his letter to them, which was the first of all his letters to the churches, was that many Christians in Thessalonica became preoccupied with the end of time and the second coming, to the point where they began to stop working. Paul therefore reprimanded them, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. He reminded them of how sensitive he was not to be a burden to anyone. Nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labour and toiled night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. In his letters to this church, Paul is as equally tender and loving as he is to the church at Galatia and Philippi. Just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children, so, affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. This brings us to the end of Paul's missionary work in Philippi, Thessalonica and Berea. And in the next podcast, we will follow St. Paul to Athens and then Corinth. We hope you've enjoyed this instalment of Journey with St. Paul. To keep up with the upcoming episodes in this special podcast series, be sure to subscribe on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or at orthodoxjourney.com.